Good morning. Again, it's good to see all of you here with us this morning. The lesson this morning is going to be a little bit different than uh, the way I normally preach. So, especially for those who are visiting, uh, you might wish to know uh, I've been preaching a series through the Gospel of Luke. And uh, tonight, Lord willing, we'll be studying in there in Luke chapter 19 about uh, Zacchaeus and how he's converted to follow Jesus. And then also a, a series of, on Romans. And then the next one on that, not quite sure when that will be, but Romans chapter 14 and how, uh, how Christians might have different uh, practices and observe different days and this sort of thing and how we all need to get along and that sort of thing. Uh, but I've also been taking some requests. And so uh, had some recent requests from, from different members. And this was actually a request from the elders that we uh, have a lesson about, uh, I'm giving the title, According to the Pattern. And so the idea of that is, is to ask us, you know, are we following the plans that God has made for us? You know, are we looking at the pattern? And this is a, kind of a fundamental concept that we should think about when we uh, try to discern, you know, as we take the word of God and then use it to transform our lives and to guide our practice as a church and as Christians. How do we, how do we look at that? We might even ask the question, is there a pattern for the church to follow? Right? I believe there is. Um, we might think about uh, maybe other organizations besides a church, you know, maybe a business. Is, is there some good ideas from a business that we could take and use that from the Lord's church? Or are we going to maybe blur the lines there and try to fit a, a square into a round hole or that sort of thing? So really, it's a, it's a lesson on uh, Bible authority. You know, do we follow the word of God or uh, or do we just make things up? You know, the word of God is recorded for us in the Bible. You know, do we respect that uh, pattern there? Because the Bible contains a pattern of good works. That's actually what Paul told Titus to follow the pattern of good works there. And of course, there's a pattern of good works for us to follow as well. And so actually, uh, this is going to be a, a two-part lesson uh, this morning, and then next next Sunday morning, uh, Dave Tenney, one of our brothers, is going to bring kind of part two to the same sort of lesson on uh, Bible authority or following the pattern. So one of the things, uh, Dave and I kind of collaborated on this, this topic, and he was like, hey, there's this book. Do you have this book? And the uh, this is maybe not the most exciting title of a book you've ever seen, Restudying the Issues of the 50s and 60s. And I actually had this book on my shelf, but it didn't jump off the shelf at me because that, that didn't really seem like a compelling topic for me to want to read that. Um, but I looked into it. You know, he, was, he, he suggested that sort of a, uh, relates to what we're talking about here. And I read through it. It's a really short little book. It's actually um, this fellow, Bill Hall, who lived back in that time with the 50s and 60s and some of the the issues in, in the, the Church of Christ that, that uh, went on about some of these issues around Bible authority. And he experienced that. And so he was giving these lessons to kind of help maybe the younger generation who didn't experience those things. Hey, what happened and what were the principles and issues at play so that we can, you know, learn from past mistakes and not repeat those mistakes by not knowing those things. And some of us here, uh, different ages and different experiences, some of us have lived through that ourselves. Um, some have no idea what we're talking about here. Uh, as for me, I, I'm a little younger than that. I was born in 1974, so this is all past for me. But I, I grew up hearing lessons about that. My, my father uh, preached. He began preaching in the 1960s, so he uh, experienced some of the things we'll talk about here this morning. And so, you know, this might seem like an obscure lesson. Uh, and so you might even disagree with some of the ideas here. We just want to put them before you and think about how we want to respect the Word of God and... Uh, hopefully grow from this. So thinking about what is this idea of a pattern, you know, what's, what's the point here? Maybe start with a ridiculous example about this idea of according to the pattern. Well, uh, we're quite familiar with the idea from the scriptures that uh, baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, we can look at a passage that says as much in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where Peter told in that first gospel sermon ever, he told the people, uh, he, he said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive 
the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we know this idea of, uh, of forgiveness of our sins. Well, the wages of sin is death, so we don't want that. But to have our sins forgiven, that's salvation. We're, we're not going to have to suffer that death. So we have the idea of being saved through this. And then even uh, going on in that context later in, in chapter 2, verse 47, where it says that people were you know, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. So we think about, well, you know, how do I join a church or something like that? Well, it tells us here that the Lord adds people to the church as they're being saved. So we have these instructions and here, and, and then the book of Acts goes on to then, you know, catalog all these different people being saved at the same, the same pattern. So I think most of us probably understand that, and that's not controversial. We understand that's the pattern of how that's done. And we might think uh, of our good brother in India, and we haven't talked a lot about him. Uh, Amban, I wonder if I pronounce his name right, wrong. Uh, Ambedkar, well, our brother in India. We'll just say that. Guduri Ambedkar. That's his first name is Guduri. Guduri Ambedkar. And uh, he, he uh, sends us uh, a report every month, and I often fail to share it with you. Although there's one back there from many months ago. But uh, this was one from this most recent one. He just sent us a couple days ago. Uh, baptisms at uh, Reka, Reka Konda Village. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right either. But, you know, the, he's sharing the gospel over there in India, and we're supporting him uh, financially. To, to, to be able to go and do all that. And that's, that's good stuff he's doing over there. So we understand that about baptism, but what about, what if we just changed it instead of actually following that pattern? Let's just make something up, you know? Well, here's something neat, you know? And nobody has ever suggested this, to my knowledge. This is just me being creative. This is wrong, in case that's not clear, but let's just say... Instead of baptism, let's have another idea. You know, there, let's have this sword arch initiation, like the like the Marines do when they have a wedding. I mean, it's beautiful. Look, look how it's symmetrical and everything. And um, and you know, it's true that the the church is the bride of Christ, and so there's a connection there. Um, we're to be soldiers of Christ. You know, we're to, to do His will and everything. So why why not do this instead of uh, baptism? You know, this really gets to the spirit of the matter, doesn't it? Because we're soldiers of Christ, and we're the bride of Christ. And so this is a really good symbol for us to think about. And some people don't like to get wet. So this would be a good alternative instead of having baptism. That might make it more effective, because more people would be, you know, hey, I don't like to be wet, but this is, this is more approachable for me. And it's beautiful, and the symbolism is so good. So that's just perfect. That's perfect. And that's, and that's right, isn't it? I mean, what's, what's wrong with that? Is it not a good idea? Well, it's it's not according to the pattern. We just read some scriptures that talk about what the, you know what God through His apostles actually prescribed for that, and to just make something else up is not according to the pattern. It's not how the apostles and the, not how the faithful early church uh, practiced becoming a Christian, and it's not how we should do it. So. Maybe that sword thing sounds like a good idea. Maybe I made a good case, you know, the bride of Christ and the soldiers of Christ. Maybe that, maybe that speaks to you. Um, I hope not, but you know, I didn't. It's not completely a bad idea. It's, it's some connection and creatively there, but I don't think it's a good idea. Um, but is that just legalism to say, well, we shouldn't do the sword thing? Um, does God actually care about a pattern? We're making this up. You know, should we should we follow God's pattern? Does God care about that? Is it important? And, uh, you know, where do we get, even get the title for this lesson? Like, the title is According to the Pattern. I mean, what's, what's that all about? Well, we can go back to the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 25, verse 40. You know, this is the context where uh, God is meeting with Moses and telling him about how to uh, build the tabernacle, which is, the, you know, the forerunner of the temple. And so he gives him all these details about how things are to be there inside the tabernacle. And at the end of all that, he says, verse 40, and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mount. So God gave a, a pattern and expected Moses to follow it in that, in that case. Now he give, gave some examples specifically about how uh, the Ark of the Testimony was to be put in there, the Ark of the Covenant, we might say, how that was to be built, and how the 
the, the bread of the presence or the, you know, the show bread, we, some translations will say how that should be in that uh, tabernacle and the golden lampstand, all those very specific things and how it's supposed to be. And the Hebrew writer, Hebrews writer in the New Testament refers to this, talks about and quotes this in all caps here, and uses the word warned, you know, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle for see, he says that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So it's a, it's a warning. It's something to not uh, just brush off, but something to take seriously if, if God gives us uh, instructions and patterns on how to conduct ourselves or some, to do something, we need to take that seriously and follow it. So, thinking of another ridiculous example, you know, what if, what if instead of uh, what Moses did, he actually, of course, did follow God's, God's pattern here and did what, what God said, but what if instead of a, of a tabernacle, he built a latrine, you know, like a, t- a bathroom or something? Well, that wouldn't be uh, according to the pattern. And then, you know, what if instead of uh, the Ark of the Covenant being in the holiest place, unlike uh, temples of other, you know, uh, idol-worshipping people would put an idol in there, but not in God's tabernacle or temple, but the Ark of the Covenant. There's no idol. There's no false image in there. But what if Moses decided, well, I'm going to put a golden calf in there, and we'll, that'll be representing God of creation. Well, we kind of already had that earlier uh, in the Old Testament where they did build a golden calf. Of course, they were uh, condemned for that, and it was, it was bad news. We shouldn't, we shouldn't do that kind of stuff. And we know we need to do all things according to Jesus' authority. The uh, New Testament tells us, Colossians 3.17, And whatever you do in word or deed, you know, whatever we do, whatever we say, and whatever we do, right? Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So when we say in the name, we're saying like in the authority of Jesus. And so we want to not just have our, our good ideas, that we might say in quotes, good ideas, because we don't really have any authority to make up our own pattern, but we're, we're to be followers of God, followers of Jesus Christ. And we know that he was given all authority. Matthew twenty eight eighteen. we referred to this in our Bible class period. This is the Great Commission. It says there, Jesus came up and spoke to them, to the apostles, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to Jesus. And so when he tells us to do things, and in this context, he goes on to, to give that great commission, we're, we're to make disciples and to, uh, to go and baptize them and teach them to follow all that Christ commanded. And so that's what we need to do. We shouldn't make up other things instead, but we should actually submit to his authority. We also know he delegated his authority to his apostles then, because in the Great Commission, he's about to ascend into heaven and leave this for them to do. But here in Matthew 16, 19, we, we have the occasion where he talks to Peter after Peter confesses Jesus as the Messiah. He says, I will give you the keys, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So giving uh, to Peter some uh, authority, as well as, by extension, the apostles to, uh, to do his will and to transmit the will of God in a prophetic way to us today through the scriptures. And we know passages like 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, where Paul writes to Timothy there saying that all scripture, all of the writings of God, all scripture is God-breathed or inspired and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so we recognize the importance and the authority of Scripture. And in, in that context, one could arguably think uh, in the, the, the New Testament church, as these things were being written, uh, perhaps he only means the Old Testament scriptures because uh, Paul is actually just writing this when he says this here, right? So, but over the course of time, we understand that the New Testament writings are scripture as well. Uh, Peter says as much in 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16 here, where it says, just, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, 
wrote to you, as also in all his letters, like we just read one of his letters, right? Sp speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, and we can agree some of what Paul wrote was hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, and here's the point, as they also do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So he's lumping Paul's letters in with the rest of the scriptures. So we understand that uh, Peter, through that same authority he's been given by Christ, is making it clear to us that even Paul's writings, his letters that he wrote to these churches, are to be considered scripture as well. Somewhat, somewhat of a casual note, that wasn't his main point here, but he does, does make that point in his other point here. So, if we think about narrowing the topic of Bible authority to uh, supporting preachers or supporting the gospel, this sort of thing. This is one of the issues that kind of came up in the 1950s and 60s. It became controversial back then. So, what does the Bible say about how this is done? So, we have uh, the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 11, 7 through 8. He says, Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself? so that you may be exalted because I proclaim the gospel of God to you without charge? I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to minister to you. And that might be kind of a puzzling passage here. So what he's, what he's saying is, um, in order to keep the peace, maybe there were some tensions with the church in Corinth, the city of Corinth being a very wealthy city, but he didn't take any money from them to do the work that he was doing as a preacher there. But instead, other congregations, probably poorer congregations, were supporting Paul so that he could preach the gospel there in Corinth. And so he's sort of, in a back backhand way, maybe saying, you know, I was actually robbing these other churches that were not as well off as you all were because of this controversy. So the point being, other churches were directly supporting Paul to preach the gospel. And by implication, Corinth could have, perhaps should have, as well, directly supported Paul to support him in his work administering the gospel. So that's beginning to see the pattern. We see that these individual churches directly support uh, Paul and others to share the gospel. So, we might ask the question again, you know, well, so who provided wages to Paul? Other churches, as I just said. And by implication, not other organizations. There wasn't some other entity that was supporting those other churches, uh, to supporting Paul. It was the churches were directly supporting Paul. And that'll become kind of part of the issue as we go on. These churches directly support Paul. And we look at Romans as we've been studying through Romans. We're not in chapter 15 yet, but we've made the point in the beginning and the end. He makes this, uh, his comments about his plans to share the gospel in Spain. So it says here in verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 24, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope passing through to see you and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. So point he's saying here being, being helped on my way by you. He's meaning I'm going to come there and you'll have an opportunity to financially support his journey to go farther out into Spain. And so the, the vision there was that the church in Rome would help directly to support Paul to share the gospel farther east in Europe where he'd never been before, where the gospel had not yet spread. And he says also in verse 28, therefore, when I have completed this and Put my seal on this fruit of theirs, sharing the sharing the um, the gift to take to Jerusalem. I will go on by way of you to Spain. So that I, again, that by way of you, you're going to be the means by which I'm able to go to Spain because the church at Rome there would be able to financially support Paul to go and do that work. So the pattern we're seeing here is that the church at Rome would directly support Paul to go preach in Spain, and there's not some other organization in the middle of that. It's just a personal situation where Paul's writing this letter to them. He's planning to come to them, and then they would directly help him to do that work. The letter to the Philippians, we see some relevance here as well. Philippians chapter 4, verse 14 says, Nevertheless, you have done well to 
fellowship with me in my affliction. And you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church fellowshiped with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. And so we see this idea of fellowship uh, kind of being uh, as used as a verb here. And it's that idea of a joint and mutual sharing. They were sharing financially to help Paul in his work there. And he's pointing out that uh, it was a difficult time where there weren't other churches directly supporting him at that time, but the, the church at Philippi was in multiple times helping him directly to support his needs. And of course, from the letter to the Philippians, we can understand that um, they had sent him funds, and they had sent him those funds uh, by a man named Epaphroditus, and it seems like uh, he wasn't just a delivery guy, but he also then stayed on as his assistant and helped Paul. And then, of course, he became ill and recovered and all of the rest that's told us there in the letter to the Philippians. But, but in that process, the church in Philippi directly sent those funds to help Paul by one of their members that they sent, Epaphroditus. And of course, there's other examples. This is the pattern that we see. You know, the church in Antioch sent out Paul and others on the missionary journeys to, to spread the gospel throughout uh, Turkey and, and Europe there. And that's the pattern we see. And so as we think about, well, what is the application to us? You know, well, we support the gospel. We support preachers according to the pattern here. Or we could make that as a question. Are we doing that according to the pattern? Well, uh, if we think about this uh, financially, is what we're kind of thinking about. But of course, we also should be praying for these situations and people that maybe we're not even directly involved with and for the gospel to spread in other countries, all of those sorts of things. And, and we should volunteer uh, to share the gospel in you know whatever context that we can. We have good people here that do that in the context of our assembly, but also each of us are hopefully sharing the good news in, in each of our spheres of influence. But thinking about financially, you know, locally, we support the gospel here. Um, myself, uh, I'm preaching here and you support me financially and thank you for that. I had a picture here with my friend Jason Harden. Uh, we recently had him preach here for us and we supported him financially to do that work, you know, his travel expenses and his time and everything for that. And we have uh, different men for a gospel meeting each year, and we, we support them locally, directly to those men. And then we think maybe regionally, not, not just here in Worcester and in Wayne County, but uh, we have a, a, a fellow named Daniel Sanders. You all know, I believe he used to preach here, but we support him financially as well in his work sharing the gospel in Norwalk, Ohio, over towards Cedar Point. Now, all this stuff is, is in a report that's posted inside this door over here. Um, if you ever want to see that, it's not a secret. There's a, a financial report every month that Rick puts together, gets, puts that in there. And so these, these are where I'm drawing this from. We also share the gospel and support the gospel internationally, share God's word. And I mentioned before about uh, Guduri Ambedkar in India. He preaches at uh, three churches over there in his area because of the lack of men to share the gospel. He has to go around and help different congregations to share the gospel. And he's also trying to uh, train other men to do that. So we support him each month to do that, to be supportive over there. We have also uh, given him special funds specifically to purchase Bibles in the language over there, Telugu, I believe is how you pronounce that language over there. And so we've sent money for that, and there's a, a photo of him presenting a Bible to a, a, a lady. A lot of times these are folks that have just obeyed the gospel, and then they are given a Bible. He also uh, works with preachers in the region to help them, to help each other, to grow, to be able to share the gospel better. And so uh, he's doing that, and we're supporting him in that. He also has some uh, a need for a vehicle 
so that he and some other of those men can go farther than just those three congregations and help other churches to share share the gospel in those other communities as well. And so we're uh, working on supporting him with a vehicle. Hopefully there'll be a photo of his vehicle and him and some other preachers going around sharing the gospel in a wider area. But what is the pattern? The pattern is there's a, a local church, such as the Burbank Road Church of Christ, directly supporting sharing the gospel, you know, supporting Guduri or, or uh, Daniel Sanders or, or whoever that we're supporting these works that we support directly. So just like the church in Rome directly supported Paul on his uh, efforts to, pre to preach the gospel in Spain, if, if indeed he was able to do that, that was the plan anyway. The Philippians directly supported Paul in sharing the gospel. And we have all those examples that we talked through. Antioch and the missionary journeys, you know, that today we're, we're doing that same idea. We're, we're directly supporting the gospel for uh, myself and Jason Harden and Daniel Sanders in Norwalk and Guduri Ambedkar in India. So the, the methods, uh, you know, whether it's a podcast or radio or, or a video, like this is being recorded and be posted on YouTube or a newspaper ad or whatever it is, we're, we're still doing the work of, of sharing the gospel, but the organization of the church is that the elders here and the church here supports directly those things. So what's the point? What's the, what's the danger? Why are we even talking about this? Well, there's some have made a new pattern, a different pattern than what we see in those churches in the New Testament and how we're trying to follow that pattern. There's some other ideas to do it differently. You might think about the business model, like uh, probably all familiar with Ford Motor Company. Of course, they've had this, this strike that's, I guess, resolved now. But they've been around 100 years. They have a good business model. They, they, Ford Motor Company manufactures cars, and then they kind of lease those cars to a dealer. And if you want to go buy a car, you go to the dealer, and you, you buy the car from them. And so the car dealers directly sell the cars to the customers. You don't buy a car from Ford Motor Company. I, I know they're actually changing some of their business model, but that's the way it's been for 100 years or whatever. And most big companies do things this way. They manufacture something, and then uh, the manufacturer will then uh, sell that wholesale to a retailer, and then that retail store will then sell things. And and that's uh, something we're pretty familiar with, unless we maybe, maybe never thought about it. But if you're involved in in sales or manufacturing or anything, you, you've, you've encountered that. Whenever you go to a store, you're buying stuff that's built in a factory somewhere else, right? We don't, we don't, uh, Ma Walmart doesn't manufacture all that stuff in the back, right? And so we might look at uh, that as a good idea to model the church after. So instead of um, having that idea where the church directly supports things, you know, we might say, what if we follow that business pattern and we have some kind of a, a human institution and we can put in the middle and then and then multiple churches can then send money to this institution and we can amplify our work and get bigger things done. Sounds like a really good idea. We have all, all kinds of different congregations contributing to that and they can have more money and have a bigger impact. And it sounds like a good idea, but it doesn't follow the pattern of the scriptures. You know, we're not running a business. We're not trying to follow Ford Motor Company. We're trying to follow God's will. And so this has been a pattern if we go back, not just to the 50s and 60s, but to the 1850s. This is uh, sort of what happened back then with the missionary societies, which is certainly well-intentioned, but sort of this changing of the, the, the way the church is organized. Well, maybe we can see well, this is a bad idea to have some non-church thing here doing the work of the church. So that's, we can, maybe we can see the problem with that. So what if we just change it to having a mega church in the middle or something? So instead of having that non-church institution, what if we just have a, a church and all these other churches can send their money to the central church and then, then the elders here in this church can be in charge of all that? 
So there's no institution anymore. It's, it's just a big church there in the middle. That's biblical, right? Because it's a church with elders. And this is kind of what happened in uh, the 1950s with the Herald of Truth uh, radio program and TV program. And then even more recently in the uh, One Nation Under God program in the, I think, the 80s, 1980s and 90s, where they shared uh, these resources and this sort of structure. But the problem is, it's not actually the pattern. Because what is the scope of the elders? What is the scope of the elders? Is the scope of the elders to do all this work for like the whole world or whatever? All these different churches, I have three on the diagram, but the idea would be, you know, hundreds of churches giving to this pattern. Well, if you look in Titus 1.5, we see where uh, Titus is being instructed by the Apostle Paul on how elders are supposed to work. He says, For this reason, I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So we see we're not supposed to just have this one group of elders in charge of everything, but every city, every church, each city would have elders. And Peter says some things on this as well in 1 Peter Five, he says, therefore, I exhort the elders among you, shepherd the flock of God among you. So the elders scope is to shepherd the flock, you know, the church, the Christians among them. So Eldred and Jim are our elders here and they're to shepherd this flock right here and not some other flock in Chicago or whatever. The scope of the elders is to shepherd the flock among us. So that's not the same pattern for churches uh, to support their work directly when they're when they're supporting other other groups. So if we compare that those patterns, you know, this pattern from Scripture is not the same as this man-made invention pattern where we're making other structures in there. Honestly, it looks a little bit more like uh, we might think of the the Roman Catholic Church when they have the the Pope and all these different levels in this hierarchy were creating a hierarchy that God never called for in this sort of a structure. So we can imagine some abuses of uh, concentration of power and money and that sort of thing that it was never intended in the pattern of the New Testament church. And maybe even a, a, a removal of, you know, well, I paid at the office, you know, instead of actually being involved in, in God's work. And this principle of how the church just be organized to do the work, kind of talking about it here with regard to supporting the gospel specifically. But, you know, these principles apply to uh, supporting needy saints. So the collection is for the needy saints, the gift in Jerusalem, the pattern we have. And so the churches sent their gift directly to the saints in Jerusalem. And there was issues in, uh, in the past, I think in the same era, with orphans homes, which unfortunately, with uh, this is before 1973 when the ab abortion was made legal and there kind of aren't very many orphans anymore because they all get killed. But back before that, there were orphans that need taken care of. And so there were questions of, well, you know, how do, how do we take care of our orphans? And the same sort of structure uh, was a problem back then for that too. Of course, we should help the needy widows and orphans. That's, that's what we're called to do. But how do we how do we do that? We hopefully do it according to the pattern. According to the pattern, it is important. In Deuteronomy four two, back in the Old Testament, it says, "You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh or the Lord your God, which I am commanding you." The word to not add to the word of God or take away from the word of God. And then similarly in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5, every word of God is tested. Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, do not add to God's words, lest he reprove you and you be proved a liar. And then in the Old Testament, or rather the uh, end of the New Testament, Revelation, Revelation 22, 18 through 19, this is the end of that of that book, talking about the book itself, but we may look at these principles more broadly to the Bible itself, where it says, I, I bear witness to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, the book of Revelation, if anyone adds to them, 
God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. So we need to be mindful that we're not adding to God's word, or taking away, but just following the pattern that we're following according to the pattern that was delivered to us. So we'll leave you with this passage, which I derived the title from Exodus 25, 40, and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. And maybe we weren't shown a pattern on the mountain, but that concept, we have the pattern given to us in the word of God, of how we ought to conduct ourselves in the church of God. So the question is, are we respecting God's pattern? Uh, with regard to that, or with regard to, uh, you know, have we been saved? Have we have we had, taken hold of the forgiveness of sins? Have we been added to the church the way we read about there in Acts chapter 2? You know, we don't make up weird things and have this Marines with the sword ceremony. Because that's not according to the pattern. We actually follow God's will for us to obey him. Because we're either obeying him or we're not and doing something else we want to do instead. Jesus said in, in Mark 16, you know, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. So he's giving two, two patterns. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. So obviously he wants us to follow the pattern to be saved. Which pattern do you choose? I encourage you to follow the pattern of obedient faith in Christ, to be added to the church as you're saved. Or if you need to be restored, we encourage you to make any changes you need to make, or if you need prayers to help get you back right with God, if you want to study some more, whatever it is, we encourage you to think on these things and act on these things. As we sing uh, 347, Who Will Follow Jesus? Will you follow Jesus? As we stand and sing the song.